Hello, I'm Nicole Mashburn again, and today we're going to talk about a cellular respiration. And basically this talk is going to be about how do we make ATP. So we've learned about chemistry, we've learned about cell biology, and so we're going to kind of put those two things together. So the chemical way that we actually make the ATP, which is the form of energy that our bodies actually use. So don't get confused between mechanical respiration and cellular respiration. Mechanical respiration is the actual act of breathing, okay? So the process of exchanging gases in our lungs. So when you breathe in and you breathe out and you're exchanging gases between the air in your lungs and the atmosphere. So you're bringing in oxygen from the air into your lungs. That's gonna go into your blood. That oxygen is gonna go down through your bloodstream to your cells. Your cells are then going to do what's called cellular respiration and make ATP. One of the byproducts of that is carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is going to come back into the blood, back to your lungs, you're going to breathe that out. So mechanical respiration brings the oxygen in, takes the carbon dioxide out. You need the oxygen for cellular respiration, and a byproduct of cellular respiration is carbon dioxide. So the two work hand in hand, but uh, Cellular respiration is not cell breathing. I've had several students say, oh, okay, so mechanical respiration is when I breathe and cellular respiration is when the cell breathes. No, cellular respiration is basically the chemical uh, steps involved in turning glucose, food, into energy. So this is how we take the foods we eat and turn it into energy we can use called ATP. All right, so make sure you have those two straightened out, mechanical respiration versus cellular respiration. Now, what is ATP? Just review from what we learned about in our chemistry or in our organic chemistry. It's adenosine triphosphate, which means you have an adenine plus a sugar and three phosphates. So think back to chemistry and we talked about how bonds, you can break bonds and make bonds. And so when you make a bond, you store energy. And when you break a bond, you release energy. So it's all about putting these phosphates together. So making, adding phosphates and breaking phosphates away, storing and releasing energy. So ATP, if you break one of those phosphates away, get rid of energy or use up the energy, allow the energy to be released, you get ADP plus P. This is a reversible reaction. If you put the P back onto ADP, you're storing the energy and you get ATP. Then again, you can break the phosphate off release the energy. So it's just a back and forth between making ADP plus P and ATP back and forth, releasing and storing, breaking and making those bonds. So remember that from what we talked about earlier in chemistry. So what we want to talk about specifically is making the ATP using the food that we eat, and I want to focus on glucose and how we make ATP from glucose through the process of cellular respiration. Uh, so when we think about a chemical reaction, we've kind of talked about a little bit of this when we talked about chemistry, how things can be made and a catabolism and anabolism. Okay, so if you have catabolism, you're breaking things down. So when you catabolize glucose, you're breaking it down. And in the presence of oxygen, if you take glucose as a six carbon uh, compound and have oxygen in uh, included in the reaction, what you're going to get, the byproducts are going to be water, carbon dioxide, ATP, and heat. So cellular respiration takes glucose in the presence of oxygen, breaks it down, and gives you water, carbon dioxide, ATP, and heat. And so the carbon dioxide is what we, we breathe off, the CO2. You also breathe off uh, some water. If you ever breathed out and you see the steam of the fog coming out of your, your mouth, that's uh, some of the water that we've either uh, generated as part of cellular respiration, some of the water in our bodies that we're, we're exhaling out. So you get rid of water, carbon dioxide, you make ATP, which then you use as your energy, and you also get a byproduct of heat. Remember, breaking bonds usually generates some heat. So how does this occur? It takes three steps. You have to go through something called glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain, which includes oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so there is a lot of detail. If you were taking a biology class or a biochemistry class, you would spend probably a week just talking about glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. I'm giving you the about 15 minute what you need to know right now. Okay, so it's a very complicated process. We're just gonna do a quick overview so that when I use this, when I say ATP, you at least know what I'm talking about and how we got it, okay, generally. 
All right, there's two ways to make ATP. You can use what's called substrate phosphorylation or oxidative phosphorylation. So phosphorylation, those phosphates, this is basically adding those phosphates on to, the, to make the ATP. So phosphorylation is basically moving those phosphates, making and breaking those bonds. So in substrate level phosphorylation, you have a compound, a substrate that has a high energy phosphate attached to it. And then in the presence of an enzyme, that enzyme will basically clip that phosphate off and put it onto an ADP. Okay, so you have the enzyme, it took the phosphate off, and it put it onto the ADP, and you made ATP. It uh, can occur in the cytosol and the mitochondria of the cell, okay, and it does not require energy, but it's not very efficient. You don't get very many ATPs. Now, a better way to get ATP is to use oxidative phosphorylation. You get a lot more ATPs this way. It's very complex, but it makes the most, and it occurs in the mitochondria. Remember, the mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cells. This is where you make most of your ATP, and it requires oxygen. Okay, and it's basically uh, like a little pump mechanism. You uh, you take uh, energy, you take uh, these electrons, and use that to pump protons into uh, into across the membrane. You basically build up a, a high concentration of hydrogen ions. And if you remember transport, uh, the hydrogen ions will go from a high concentration to a low concentration, and as they uh, move back down their concentration gradient, they cause this little apparatus, little gizmo, to start to work, and the byproduct of that is that you add a phosphate to ADP and get ATP. Now I've got a video to show you this, okay? So don't freak out. Say, what did you just say? Gizmo? What? Just wait. You'll see the little video and it'll kind of make sense on how that works. It's a very complicated process, but you get a lot of ATPs this way, okay? Now, when you talk about cellular respiration, this making of ATP, it can be made in the cytosol and the mitochondria, okay? Using those three steps glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. Those are the three steps. The first step is glycolysis. And glycolysis, that means to, lysis means to cut, cut glucose. And you're going to cut glucose, which is a six carbon um, a molecule, into two molecules of pyruvic acid. And this pyruvic acid, these each have three carbons. So you take a six carbon something and break it into a two, three carbon somethings. Okay, so you take glucose into pyruvic acid. So you actually get two of these. Okay, and this is occurring in the cytosol. Now, as a byproduct of that, you're going to get some in, uh, high energy electrons, and electrons are going to be what goes into that electron transport chain eventually to make most of those ATPs. And you also get um, a byproduct of ATP via substrate level phosphorylation. So you get some ATPs in the cytosol simply by breaking down the glucose. Okay. Now, the pyruvic acid is going to go through, there's a little step right here where you actually take pyruvic acid and turn it into acetyl-CoA. Okay, and that's what actually goes into the citric acid cycle. So you have this little intermediate step. So the acetyl-CoA is then going to go into the citric acid cycle. And as it goes into the citric acid cycle, chemical reactions are going to occur, bonds are going to be made and broken, and you're going to get some things called NADH and FADH. Okay. My pen broke, so I'm having to use my mouse, and I apologize for that. NADH and FADH. And these are things that uh, can store up these high energy electrons. They, ca they carry these high energy electrons. So they're electron carriers. And so it's a way to carry those electrons over into the uh, electron transport chain and make even more ATP. So one of the byproducts of taking acetyl-CoA into the citric acid cycle is you get these chemicals that carry electrons and you get more ATP. And again, this ATP is again made by substrate level phosphorylation. You don't get very much. All right, but what you've done so far is made a bunch of electrons, and this is what you want. You want these electrons because they power that oxidative phosphorylation. That's the kind of way you get the most ATPs. So once you've made all these byproducts, all these go into the electron transport chain, and via oxidative phosphorylation, you get a ton of ATPs. All right, now. I'm going to show, stop here and let you watch just um, a quick video that kind of gives you a 3D animation of how this works, and then I'll see you on the other side, and we're going to figure out exactly how many ATPs we got by doing this, okay? 
As this mountain biker heads up the trail, the breakfast he ate this morning is being burned to power his bike ride. His breathing rate increases as his leg muscles demand more oxygen to burn more fuel. Let's zoom down to where this fuel is burned, our cells. Here, the blood vessel on the left delivers fuel and oxygen to a single muscle cell. In cellular respiration, energy in fuel is converted to ATP, shown here as starbursts. Most ATP is made in the cell's mitochondria. ATP powers the work of the cell, such as contraction. Let's take a closer look at how ATP is produced from a molecule of glucose, our fuel. Only the carbon skeleton is shown to keep things simple. The first step is called glycolysis, and it takes place outside the mitochondria. To begin the process, some energy has to be invested. Next, the molecule is split in half. Now, the molecule NAD+, an electron carrier, picks up electrons and hydrogen atoms from the carbon molecule, becoming NADH. Keep track of the electron carriers. They play an important role by transporting electrons to reactions in the mitochondria. In the final steps of glycolysis, some ATP is produced, but not much. For every glucose molecule, only two net ATPs are produced outside the mitochondrion. However, glycolysis has produced pyruvic acid, which still has a lot of energy available. Let's follow this pyruvic acid molecule into a mitochondrion to see where most of the energy is extracted. As the molecule enters the mitochondrion, one carbon is removed, forming carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Electrons are stripped, forming NADH. Coenzyme A attaches to the two-carbon fragment, forming acetyl-CoA. Coenzyme A is removed, and the remaining two-carbon skeleton is attached to an existing four-carbon molecule that serves as the starting point for the citric acid cycle. The new six-carbon chain is partially broken down, releasing carbon dioxide. Several electrons are captured by electron carriers, and more carbon dioxide is released. The carbon dioxide that you exhale comes from the reactions of cellular respiration. Two ATPs are produced by the citric acid cycle for each molecule of glucose. At this point, only a small number of ATPs have been produced. However, more energy is available in the electrons that are being transported by electron carriers. While the citric acid cycle starts another round, let's follow an electron carrier to the next step in the process. Electron carriers such as NADH deliver their electrons to an electron transport chain embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. The chain consists of a series of electron carriers, most of which are proteins that exist in large complexes. Electrons are transferred from one electron carrier to the next in the electron transport chain. Let's take a closer look at the path electrons take through the chain. As electrons move along each step of the chain, they give up a bit of energy. The oxygen you breathe pulls electrons from the transport chain, and water is formed as a byproduct. The energy released by electrons is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, creating an area of high hydrogen ion concentration. Hydrogen ions flow back across the membrane through a turbine. Much like water through a dam, the flow of hydrogen ions spins the turbine, which activates the production of ATP. These spinning turbines in your cells produce most of the ATP that is generated from the food you eat. The process you've just observed, cellular respiration, generates 10 million ATPs per second in just one cell. That ATP can power a biker up the trail, or it can power your brain cells as you learn challenging biology topics. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that video. It's, I think it's a great video to kind of give you an idea of what's going on. Again, the point of this video is to say, okay, we're taking something and we're getting something else out of it. So let's go back. Remember when we talked about ATP? Let's say something really quick. So to kind of help you think about what we're doing here. Uh, if you are tired, a lot of times the first thing you do is you go and you grab something sweet like a candy bar. And you may think, oh, this is going to give me some energy. 
Well, it does, but you're not actually using the energy of the glucose in the in the candy bar. You've got to break that down into something else. Um, it's kind of like if uh, you need to put quarters in um, in your parking meter, and you have a five dollar bill, and it won't take that. And so, but you actually need quarters. So imagine that the uh, five dollars is your your Snickers bar, and you need quarters to put into your parking meter. You need something in between there. You need a, a, a bill changer to turn the, the dollars into quarters. That's what cellular respiration does. It takes the glucose, the Snickers bar, and turns it into the ATP that you can actually use. All right? So when you take a glucose molecule, how much ATP do you get? Your net gain is 30 ATP. So one glucose will give you 30 ATPs. So where do we get those 30 ATPs? You get two from glycolysis. Now, you actually make four, but you, you have to use two of them. So it actually takes energy to make energy. So the net is two ATPs by substrate level phosphorylation. That's how many you get out first. You also get those byproducts. Just remember those electron carriers that you're gonna need later into the electron transport chain. You get some of those. Uh, you get that pyruvic acid, which is then converted to acetyl-CoA, which is what actually goes to the citric acid cycle. One of the byproducts of that, some more of that NADH, which you also need to go to the electron transport chain to make even more ATPs later. As acetyl-CoA goes to the citric acid cycle, it gives off more ATP. You get two more ATPs. Not very many, because substrate level phosphorylation, but you do get some more. So now we have four, all right? That's not very many. So how do we get to this 30? Well, all of those NADHs, those electron uh, carriers. They're going to carry those electrons, the FADH are going to carry those electrons to the electron transport chain and then through oxidative phosphorylation you're going to generate about 20 ATPs. So this is the multiplication. So for your NADHs you can multiply 2.5, FADH 1.5 and your total result is 28 ATPs for every one glucose. Alright, so add 28 plus 2 plus 2 that gives you 32. But remember, it always takes a little energy to make energy, so you have to subtract two, and you get about 30 ATPs is your net. So one glucose will give you around 30 ATPs. You know, it's a little plus or minus, so it's not maybe not exact science, but that's that's generally what's going to happen. So this is your energy yield that occurs during cellular respiration. So remember, this is the what you need to know for this class at this point. Okay, so just I want you to remember what mechanical respiration is what cellular respiration is, what are the general steps of cellular respiration, what are we trying to do? We're trying to take glucose, we're trying to turn it into ATP by going through glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, the electron transport chain. What two processes, as we're doing that, do we actually make the ATP? We use substrate level phosphorylation, we use oxidative phosphorylation. Where do these things occur? Glycolysis occurs in the cytosol, Okay, the citric acid cycle occurs in the mitochondria. The electron transport chain occurs in the mitochondria. Where does oxidative phosphorylation occur? In the mitochondria. Where does substrate level phosphorylation occur? The cytosol and the mitochondria. Okay, so that kind of summed everything up for you. Again, you're welcome to look in your textbook. There's a whole chapter on this. You can learn as much as you want to about it, but that's all you need to know at this point. Thank you very much.